Well, in a couple of weeks, Art and Crafts Affair will be held down in the railroad park. People come there to buy things. Why do we buy things there instead of Walmart? You go buy some trinkets at Walmart. Because those beautiful things at the Art and Crafts Affair are handmade and beautiful. And we love to know the person who made them. In fact, a person came in when I was at the gallery and she bought these two little pots and she wanted to know the artist who made them and she wanted to have his name put in there because she was going to give him as a gift. We'd like to know the person who made them. The problem comes with handmade stuff is that we, when we also value a handmade religion. You know what that is? It's well, creative people. You know, we don't want a, a hand-me-down religion that seems to be forced on us by some institution. We want something lovely and vibrant and hopeful and colorful. So we take this little bit from that religion and this little bit from that religion and this little bit from that culture and this little bit from that movie and we put them all together and we make up our own religion. A handmade religion just for me. It's my religion. I heard a guy whose friend died and he said to himself, well, he just moved to Colorado. He'd made himself a handmade religion to comfort himself. It doesn't really matter if it's real or not. <laughs> it just has to be attractive. Handmade religion. You know, it's even better if you can make a buck off it. If you can make money. Or, I don't know, gain some prestige from your religion. Or, or maybe even some power and authority. You know, I've heard it's good for business to go to church. Good for politicians, too, isn't it? to say you go to church and have your picture taken there in the pew looking real holy. It's good for, it's good for a candidate. Handmade religion can be very useful with the right manipulation. Well, that's just what Stephen is up against in his trial today. He, he tackles his accuser's handmade religion. Now, let's read this. It's in Acts 7, 44 to 50. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses commanded him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors, ancestors in turn received it and with Joshua brought it in when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers until the days of David. He found favor in God's sight and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in sanctuaries made with hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What sort of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is my resting place? Did not my hand make all these things? So Stephen has been defending himself in the court, the highest court of the land, the Sanhedrin. It's run mostly by Sadducees who have set up this sweet deal with the Romans so that they have their little scam running in the temple making themselves lots of money. They destroy anyone who's going to threaten their cool deal they got going here. And so they executed Jesus. Now Stephen, who's a follower of Jesus, is in their court and he's threatened with execution. And for his defense now, he's been summarizing the history of Israel to show how they've been rejecting God all along. They're the ones who've been blaspheming God, not Stephen. They've been worshiping idols from the very beginning when God led them out of Egypt. That's what Stephen has been saying. So continuing his accusation, Stephen now starts in on the temple. They said he was blaspheming God because he was speaking against the temple. Well, here's the deal. Apparently, by this time, the Jews had been regarded their temple the same way the Greeks did regarded their temples. The Greeks believed that the god of the temple actually lived in the temple. Yeah, okay, they lived up on Mount Olympus, but they'd visit there maybe, for, I don't know why, but they would come and live in this temple. So the Jews thought that God lived in the temple like that. And when anyone spoke against the temple, then of course they're blaspheming God. They had created a beautiful handmade religion. I want you to notice something here. Stephen doesn't even mention this abomination that Herod had created and he called the temple. Magnificent, 
enormous stones, gold leaf. Josephus says if you looked at it, it would blind you if, if you looked at it at the dawn when the sun was leap, leaping off of the thing. Yeah, this is something that Herod had built, and Stephen doesn't even mention it. No, he doesn't start with the temple of Herod. He starts with the tabernacle that Israel had carried with them through their wandering in the desert after being liberated from Egypt. He calls it the tabernacle of testimony. What does that mean? Well, it means it's a witness against them because the tabernacle contained the Ten Commandments carved into stone, you know. It was the tabernacle of testimony, a witness against them that they had never obeyed those laws that God had given them for their covenant. Now, was God in that tabernacle? Like the pagans thought their God inhabited their temple? No, if you actually read the accounts and listen to what it actually says, listen, I thought God was in the temple until I actually looked at it now. It's clear God wasn't in the temple or the tabernacle. It says the name of God was in there. The name of God was in there. That's his reputation. His glory was in there as a form of a cloud and a fire, a pillar of fire. But that wasn't God. God himself was not there. God has never been captive like a bird in a gilded cage. The idea is ludicrous. So Solomon, in his wisdom, knew that when he built his magnificent temple. After he'd finished the temple and the cloud of the glory of God had filled it, this is what he said in 1 Kings 8.27. But will God indeed live on earth? Even heaven, the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. And then he goes on to say God dwells in heaven. Now, what's the problem Stephen sees? He sees that his accusers in the court were following in the footsteps of their ancestors who had created this handmade religion. Their religion blasphemed God by putting idols in the temple. 1 Kings 21, 3 to 9 tells us about the sins of the king of Manasseh. He set a carved image of Asherah, who this is, in the temple along with other altars. Asherah was a fertility god, and so you can imagine what was going on in the temple with king in Manasseh. Jeremiah prophesies against Israel, saying in Jeremiah 7 to 9, 9 to 11, Do you steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? And then, do you come and stand before me in this house called by my name and say, We are delivered so we can continue all these detestable things? Has this house, which has been called by my name, become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I have seen it. <laughs> it's no wonder Jeremiah got thrown into a pit, right? The Lord also spoke about this idolatry in Ezekiel 9 to 11. He said to me, go in there and see the terrible and detestable things they're committing in the temple. I went in and looked, and there, engraved all around the wall was every sort of detestable thing, crawling creatures and beasts as well as the idols of the house of Israel. Seventy elders from the house of Israel were standing before these things. That's what Ezekiel saw in the temple. So Stephen accuses the religious leaders of his day doing the same sort of thing. They had made a god out of Herod's abomination temple and their traditions. God was not there. The cloud of glory of God was not there. His name was blasphemed by the very presence of this temple of Herod. This is what Stephen has been saying. It wasn't Stephen who's blaspheming God. His accusers were blaspheming God by the religious adultery, their handmade religion. They were not worshiping God. They were worshiping their handmade religion. So what did Stephen know about the true temple of God, where God actually dwells? He knew that Jesus himself had replaced the temple and that God now lived in and among his people by means of the Holy Spirit. As Paul taught, every gathering of people who believe in Jesus is a temple of God. We're a temple of God right here, not the building, us as the people of God. Stephen knew that this wasn't a handmade religion, 
This was the promise of God. Stephen knew that we stand on the promises of God and nothing else. Humans everywhere, though, were just so tempted to create a handmade religion. God's created by our own hand and our own mind. Even Christians seem to be prone to this idolatry, just like the ancient Jews were. We're humans. This is what humans are tempted to do. We're no different. Our traditions can become gods to us. Our preferences can become gods to us. I mean, look at this picture. It's a white guy with blue eyes, supposed to be Jesus. He didn't look anything like that. Anybody with any thinking about it at all knows he's a Middle Eastern guy and he looked more like Bin Laden. Didn't look like this. Yet we worship this. This is called syncretism. You know what this uh, word means? Heard that word, syncretism? It means when people combine their traditions with the religion they received. Syncretism means to have a handmade religion. You know, you hear about it in Africa and voodoo and all these things where they combine Christian stuff with their traditions and come up with something else. And in Asia too, ancestor worship and so on. And, but we do it in the US too. We, we do it. We, you know, the interesting thing is that people don't realize they're in a culture and they don't realize really that they're making this handmade religion. It just kind of happens. In America, our syncretism could be called American folk Christianity. Here's an example. I don't know if you can read this, but it's a, it's a quote out of Psalms that is written to Israel. It's a promise to Israel, but people take it on as for America. It's not American. It's so easy for any country to confuse their religion with patriotism and culture, and it may result in the same kind of idolatry the Jews were doing in Stephen's day. I'm gonna point out some characteristics. I got this list, and you can add to it, I'm sure. These are characteristics of American folk Christianity. I got this from uh, Roger Upton on his blog, and he quoted a, a former Bethel professor um, at Bethel Seminary, Roger E. Olson. This is really the source of all this. <clears throat> First of all, American folk Christianity is based on emotions and feelings. You know, we might say, and I've said this myself, I have a strong impression God wants me to do something. <laughs> Where did that come from? Or maybe you dreamt something. I had a friend uh, who if he dreamt something, it must be something God is telling him. I mean, what? If we tell somebody to follow their heart, you heard that? Well, just follow your heart, brother. Well, Jeremiah 17, 9 laments, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And you tell someone to follow their heart? The problem becomes acute because of the next point. American Christ folk Christianity is not thoughtful. It doesn't reflect on the consequences and alternatives. I, I used to read the devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest, and there's some good stuff in there. It's by a, a pastor. But the, some of his counsel is absolutely wrong, and we just accept it because it's in a devotional book. This is what it said. Never ask the advice of another about anything God makes you decide before him. If you ask advice, you're nearly always going to side with Satan. What? Don't ask advice. It's absolutely against the scripture. And yet, people grab onto that. I did myself until I started thinking about it. Reflect on what you are accepting. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 to 22 says, test all things. Hold on to what's good, but avoid everything that's evil. 1 John 4, 1 exhorts, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Yet we often accept the devotional book, or a, a word from a pastor, or a, a spiritual advisor, or some blog on the internet, without examining it. Let's be wise in what we accept and what we believe in, and how we handle religious things. It's, it's like this next point, number three. 
American folk Christianity repeats sayings so often we assume they're true like a cliche. Many times these thoughts are made into merchandise. Some sayings actually replace the scriptures like the one I just said in the devotional. Here's, I, saw, I thought of a whole bunch of these <laughs> and I'm sure you could uh, add to them but I'm just gonna run through this real quick and uh, Terry liked the first one especially. Christian musicians are good theology, theologians and are always right. So if you sing a Christian song, it must be right, correct? No, <laughs> not necessarily. And where, where did the whole idea of blessing animals and crops and beer and wine and cheese come from? That's not in the Bible. Animals go to heaven, especially my pet. The quote, all dogs go to heaven. Some people actually believe this. It's not in the Bible. <clears throat> Thanksgiving prayers are important. Grace before meals are, are supposed to be done. Other domestic rituals that are religious. We had a friend who had uh, 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 saints over all her door jams. And all the saints had to do something with blessings. The occupants of the... Where does this come from? That might actually be... Greek folk <laughs> Christianity, I don't know. How about popular accounts, you know, stories, books of traveling to and from the afterlife? There's been quite a few books about this recently, and one was even proved to be a false truth. <laughs> We'd love these things, but most of them have nothing to do with the gospel. It's like they have nothing to do with the Bible either. Or we use the Bible, or we use a crucifix, or religious jewelry, or religious art as talismans. A talisman means if I carry this thing with me, I'll have good luck, right? Or if I hang it on my wall, or... So we have a cross hanging on our wall. How would I feel if I threw that thing into the fire? I would feel bad. Or when I was a teacher, I think I told you this before, I, I was reading from Ephesians, this is important, incredible scriptures, and I looked up and all the kids were jabber-jabbering amongst them and passing notes, so I took the Bible and I threw it against the wall. And they all went, Whoa! Mr. Lynn just threw a Bible against the wall. And I said, well, if it was a computer with a scripture in it, would that bother you if I threw that against the wall? Well, no. The Bible has become a god to you. So you see what I'm saying? Church buildings are particularly holy places the sanctuary of God. A church building is a building. It's a place to get together. It's a, it could be anything. It could be a, a shed. It's not particularly holy. Your traditional liturgy, the liturgy of whatever church you go to, that's not holy. And the appearance of the church or the appearance of the pastor, that's not holy. American folk religion. Well, this is more simple. The devil has horns and is red. We all know that's not wrong, but it gets repeated over and over and over. Some people actually believe it. Angels have wings. Where does that come from? Angels look like pretty something 20-year-old 20, 20 girls <laughs> or, or little tiny baby, little fat babies. People become angels when we die. Have you heard that over and over? Or when a child says, a child dies and someone says, well, God wanted another little angel in heaven. What a sad lie. There are systems of interpretation of prophecy. Man, do you see a lot of this on the internet about the end times and trying to correlate current events with that? They misinterpret scripture entirely and then try to get current events to go with it. It's over and over and over. How about this one? If it ain't the King James, it ain't the Bible. I've heard that. I actually had to kick a guy out of church because he was trying to buttonhole people to argue about this. How about this one? God can do anything. Can God do anything? I had a middle school kid thought he was really smart. Can God make a stone so heavy that he can't lift it? Well, the misunderstanding is that God can't do anything. There are things God can't do, like things that can't be done. God got some guns made our country great. That was bumper stickers that were going around for a while. 
America has been especially blessed by God more than other countries because we are a Christian nation. Not true. It's American folk Christianity. Uh, here, how about this one? This is the one I grew up with. To be a Christian means that you're a Republican patriot. Democrats aren't Christians. That's I grew up with that. That's American folk Christianity. How about this one? Our Constitution is inspired by God. That's Mormon theology, which is an American religion. How about this one? Some psychic traditions are Christian, like dowsing or spiritual healing. And how about, how about yoga or other Christian wellness traditions? Do they fall into this area? Got to be discerning. How about this? Trouble that you go through is payback because of your bad behavior. What did I do to deserve this? Another word for that is karma. That's not in the Bible. Or how about this one? I see this one over and over. There's a reason for everything. No, there isn't a reason for everything. Some things just happen. But God has promised for Christians to create good out of bad. That doesn't mean it happened for that reason. How about this one? God wants us happy. Well, if he wanted you happy, you would never get sick and die, right? And there's lots of people who are unhappy that are going, undergoing persecution. God will bless you with prosperity if you have enough faith. If you don't have faith, you won't be prospering. If you're not prospering, then you don't have faith, brother. Oh, that makes me mad means that rich people are more godly than poor people. People believe this, American folk Christianity. Prayer can be treated like a magic spell. Y'all heard of that prayer of Jabez some years ago, a little book that went around? Prayer isn't a magic spell. Prayer is talking to Almighty God who loves us and cares for us and answers prayer. It's not a magic spell. American folk Christianity loves myths, legends, and unverifiable miracle stories. You read a lot of this kind of stuff in Reader's Digest, for example. Think of those books about people who come back from the dead to report what they saw and experienced. Preachers tell stories that have been handed down that have no basis, in fact. We've all heard, I think, about the needle's eye gate in Jerusalem that the camel has to kneel before it can go through the gate because it's so low. There is nothing like that. It's a lie. And preachers keep repeating this, and we find it in books of 2,000 illustrations for preachers. Got to be careful what we accept and what we believe. These things can become idols to us. In fact, some of you are probably mad at me because I've poked an idol that you like. There it is. That's why Stephen got executed. It's the same problem. There are so many of these things, and we are inspired by, by lies. We should do it. My mom told my older brother when he'd come home with a whopper. He used to lie a lot, my older brother, when he was a kid. This is a family legend. Anyway, so he came home, and he's talking about a helicopter or something, and she says, now, son, you start with this by telling me that I have a good story I made up, and then you can tell me anything. That's what we should be doing. Identify things that are true and things that are from the Bible and things that aren't really from the Bible. Maybe not all these things are fiction and maybe not all of them are bad. It's just that we have to be careful and discerning about what we accept. Because these lies can become false truth if we're not discerning. Think we're believing the truth and we're not. That we're believing a lie. We should not believe our handmade Christianity without thinking about it. We should not be, as Ephesians 4.14 says, infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Man, you see this in politics, all kinds of situations. Crafty, deceitful scheming using things that we think are sacred. Let's not allow ourselves 
to be, as Hebrews 13.9 says, carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Handmade real Christianity can be fun and inspirational, even pretty or macho, but these traditions and iron ideas and their objects and their buildings, this can result in idolatry, like the worship of ancient Israel. Handmade Christianity may not exalt Jesus. It may not point others to Christ. It may actually chase people away because they know it's absurd and silly. They may not accurately communicate God's truth. Not all these things are evil, but you got to be careful. Some are neutral, yeah. Some are good. Be aware. It's so important that we Christians compare everything we believe to the truth of Scripture as it's written. Scripture correctly understood in its context, not just the verses before and after, but the whole letter or whatever, and the culture of the time it was written as much as we can figure out, correctly understood in the context, carefully applied with reflection. Not everything that's written in there is written to you to apply directly to your life or to your country's life. Be careful how you apply it. Think about it. We don't want to worship our traditions or our objects or stories and end up believing lies because we've created some kind of handmade Christianity. We want to be standing on the promises as they're written. Standing on the promises of Christ our Lord. And now I want to sing that song. Standing on the promise.